Thanks, Linda, for that um, very detailed analysis um, <coughs> of the political situation in Zimbabwe. Um, and you have set the context for the discussion that Farai and I will have um, mainly around the diamonds, but I'll, I'll also be coming um, with a very broader human rights perspective of what's been happening. Um, in the midst of all this political intrigue, those of us who work on, on the ground in Zimbabwe see the effects um, of the, the, the government's desire to retain control at whatever costs. So um, as senior researcher on Southern Africa for Human Rights Watch, I've been working on Zimbabwe now for seven years, and we've been working on the country way before that. Uh, so when we look at Zimbabwe, we see the numbers and we see the figures. And for me, the theme that runs through this, uh, these years is of, of Mugabe's 31-year presidency is that of impunity. And it leads me to what's happening in the Marangi Diamond Fields. So for the killings in the 70s, culminating in 1986, 10,000, 20,000 people killed um, during the Bukurahundi by Mugabe's 5th Brigade. Um, no accountability for that. No one brought to justice. We go into 2000, the land seizures, um, scores of farmers and thousands of farm workers, scores of farmers killed and then thousands of farm workers displaced um, from, the, from the land. No accountability, no justice, no compensation for what happened to them. They took their case to the Sadiq Tribunal. Very important ruling was made there that they had been displaced and that what had happened there um, had been um, in violation of the rule of law. Zimbabwe was very successful uh, in campaigning for the Sadiq Tribunal to be suspended. So even though the Sadiq Tribunal made this very important uh, decision, um, it has now been suspended. It's no longer looking at any new judgments um, and cannot speak um, towards the, the implementation of any form of compensation for those farmers who took the case before it. 2005, like Linda talked about, um, a million people, businesses and homes destroyed um, by Mugabe and his authorities. Uh, to this day, hundreds of thousands of them remain without housing and without any homes. Um, they have not been compensated. They are homeless. Um, the government claimed that it had this Operation Garikai, which was supposed to give them back their homes. They only built a few houses, about, I don't know, 10,000. It didn't adequately cover. And we don't know where the, these houses um, went to, because we know from Amnesty International that many of the people who were displaced did not get their, um, were not rehoused in those homes. That leads us to 2008. Um, I was on the ground from the first election, uh, the first round in March, when it was all looking relatively peaceful. Um, and I was on the ground when things started to go bad. Um, a month afterwards, Mugabe decided that he was not going to let go of this um, of his presidency and he was going to force a second round of elections. I was on the ground and I interviewed the hospitals, I went to the hospitals, I interviewed the victims in those hospitals. Um, we estimate <coughs> modestly that about 200 people were killed, 5,000 tortured and tens of thousands more displaced, but that's a very, very modest estimate. We believe that it could have been hundreds more who were killed, thousands more tortured, uh, many of whom were trapped in the rural areas. Again, we know who was behind this. We interviewed people who talked about the armies and the soldiers um, and certain commanders within Zimbabwe's army who are involved in this brutality or <coughs> leading the brutality or ordering people, uh, their soldiers to go out and torture and beat people. To this day, there has been no accountability for what took place then in 2008. So the story of Zimbabwe is one of impunity. 2008, November, so this is after the brutality that took place in June. Mugabe <coughs> has declared itself president. He's been forced into a government of national unity with Morgan Shangirai of the MDC. He's, as Linda said, his government is rocking. They have no resources. He decides, he remembers that diamonds have been what discovered in Marangi in 2006. He had encouraged the people to go into Marangi and dig for the diamonds themselves. 35,000 people were in these diamond fields. But this time he thinks, okay, what do I do next? In a very similar fashion to what he did when it came to the land seizures, he decides to wrest control of those fields from the people who are there. But he doesn't do this in a peaceful manner or in a manner that actually follows the rule of law. No, he sends helicopter gunships, he sends about 2,000 soldiers into the fields, they kill about 200 people. This 
is not really widely reported at the time. It happens October, November 2008. There's not much in terms of reporting around this issue. We read a report, we go in to Zimbabwe around February 2009 because we're saying, well, 200 people were killed. That's terrible, you know? How could 200 people have been killed in such a short period of time? And no one is actually saying anything about it um, apart from a few journalists. We go in and we find that not many NGOs in Harare know what's going on in the, in the country. Um, they don't know what's going on in Mutare. They have no idea that um, this, these killings have taken place. And then we discover that one organization that is based there has been following closely what's going on. And that's the organization of Farai Magu here in the Center for Research and Development. And finally, we go in. And we are directed, we meet with Farai. We also go to the mortuaries. We speak to the morgue attendants. And this is in the midst of a cholera outbreak in Zimbabwe. Because you know the economy is, <coughs> has collapsed, the health system has collapsed. The bodies of those who were killed um, during that period of time in the, on the on the diamond fields were being mixed up with the victims of cholera, and the authorities were trying to pass them off as cholera deaths. But when we spoke when we spoke to the morgue attendants, saw some of the bodies, we knew that this was not the case. They had bullet holes. Some of these bodies had been had clear bullet wounds, showing that they'd been killed and shot by the army. So there's clear evidence. We visit some of the mass graves. We visited two mass graves. Um, we understand that there were even more mass graves in the fields themselves, but we weren't able to access those fields. Um, and Farai also and others have been unable to access those fields because of the high security levels in these fields. So we know eventually we come to a, a number, and again, it's a very conservative number. We say around 200 people were killed on the fields based on what we have gathered in terms of the bodies we've seen, um, the numbers of people we believe are in these mass graves and other interviews with Farai, and some of the witnesses and victims um, of what happened on that day, on those days, in fact, it was a period of days. Again, we come up with a report talking about what's going on in Marange. Farai's organization has already released a report by then, but because they're a local organization, people don't say much, and there's not enough attention paid to the situation. Um, but our, our combined work, our report, and their report combined, when we released the, the, the report, um, suddenly the international community wakes up and says, oh, what's going on here? And the Kimberley process becomes involved and sends in a mission to find out um, what has taken place. Um, and I will allow for right to talk more about the ineffectiveness of the Kimberley process, um, uh, which has led to this recent decision um, where it has uh, ignored the human rights issues and focused merely on the revenue that's uh, likely to come out and on how to control um, the fields so that um, everyone can uh, import and export diamonds from Marange happily um, and no one needs to worry, forgetting about the community and what's been happening. As we speak, since 2008 and since this massive case, <coughs> <conflict, coughs> despite the fact that there's overwhelming evidence, again in Zimbabwe, there has been no accountability for the killings that took place at that particular time. So this leads us now, and I'm about to conclude, because I think it's very important for Farai to have the time. He's the one who's always on the ground, um, and he's the one who deals with some of the issues. He himself has been arrested and attacked by the authorities because of his work. Um, it leads us to now, where there's a, a very weak deal on the table. As Linda has said, there are elections coming up again. The very people who have committed abuses from the 80s are still sitting in power as we speak. The MDC is a relatively wicked force when it comes to political control of government. It is sitting there, um, but it has no authority whatsoever. As Linda has said, there's a lot of jostling within ZANU-PF. But those who are in the ascendancy, from our perspective, from what I can see, seem to be the military, the defense minister, Emerson Nagagwa, and others who have a very, very dirty past. Who, for whom it is a, there are huge stakes at play, not just in terms of resources, but in terms of if they were to step down, given the history of abuses and their involvement in these atrocities. I mean, we can forget about Mugabe because he's old, but these guys have a lot to lose. Elections are coming up in 2012. All signs are that these elections may be as violent and as nasty as those that took place in 2008, or even worse because of what is at stake. Um, so on that note, I'll hand over to Farai. Okay, thank you.